Well, I guess we can do an official introduction. Christian Henson, Paul Thompson, the founders of Spitfire Audio, who we've uh, formed a partnership with over the last couple of years. And we we're just so thrilled to finally be able to talk with you guys and meet you in person. This is the first time we've met. Um, I know we've talked with Ben about trying to get out to London at some point and, and checking out your guys' space, but obviously things got in the way. But that's still in my plan. I, I would love to come check it out at some point. But how are you guys? How's everything going? Very good. Very good. Yeah, we're. Um, it's obviously been a bit of a weird uh, year and a half, but um, but we have been able to, luckily we've just been able to kind of, for the most part, carry on as we were. Um, we did a we did a quite a quick pivot to everybody kind of working remotely. Um, but also we've been able to, uh, apart from a couple of short periods, we've been able to carry on recording new musicians, keeping the musicians busy and in the studios. So it's to that extent, it's been, um, you know, it's been okay, but yeah, crazy. Time. I would imagine that this, this, pandemic thing because we've talked to a lot of composers who have explained to us and uh peter rotter one of the the orchestra bookers about how everyone has like a home setup now and for you guys that are creating sample libraries does that make your job a little easier now that people have all these home setups and you can get some of these sounds recorded uh from home I mean, I think it's great. It's it's great for musicians because I I've always maintained, regardless of the, the the budget, that there's never there's never an excuse not to use a live musician, and I think that actually makes it that much easier. And that's something I'm going to be really really pushing uh, us to encourage people to do. We recently released this thing called Solstice, and uh, I curated it, and I purposely didn't record any solo instruments because I feel if you want a, a Celtic harpist or or a, a violinist, uh, you should reach out to them. And now with all of these home setups, that enables composers at whatever level you are to form these very important relationships. I think one of the things that is really important to do as part of your experience as a composer is to actually practice working with musicians because one mass of musicians pretty much works the same as one musician. So it's great. But Paul, I don't know if you agree for us, uh, uh, we're as much about the room as about the well no that's probably not it's not as much about the room it's about the player it's about their instruments but we're also very into these rooms as well yeah the room is very important and i think um it's been an interesting you can kind of make something work with uh, at the very beginning of the first lockdown last year um we did an experiment where i wrote a little short piece of music and got the, the uh, BBC Symphony Orchestra musicians to record it on their phones. Oh. And we thought this will either sound terrible and be completely un unusable or it'll, or it'll kind of come together and sound great. And we managed to make it sound like a, a, you know, an orchestra kind of recorded in a room. But the real, the real kind of um, thing, you, you just can't really, you can't really get away with it. So I think, for us, we, we really do desperately need to be in these amazing rooms recording the, you know, it's 50% of the sound, we always reckon, is, is the kind of the way that the room reacts to the players. Um, but, you know, the players have very quickly got to the point where they've been able to find, you know, spaces in their homes that are uh, acoustically okay enough for them to record. And, you know, they've spent their whole careers watching engineers putting mics up around yeah. them, so they know where to put the mics. Um, but yeah, it, it's a it's a weird one. It, it's great for recording soloists. At yeah, home. yeah, that's fantastic. But but when you want to record a group of musicians, it's really hard unless they're in a nice sounding room together. Can I do a, a quick plug? Plug. It's uh, for, uh, for Ninita Desai's um, list, which is with the Ivers Academy. If you want British musicians to do overdub soloists. Um, that's a great thing to check hmm. out. We're we're uh, scheduled. She's going to be joining our the in the season before we're before we wrap up. So we'll we'll have to ask her about that too. But yeah, she's she's killing it. We love her her work. Um, so we obviously you guys have this great thing going with Spitfire. You're you were composers and and still are. Um, but we'd love to know just kind of the whole evolution of how this happened. Because um, you have a short bio on the website, but um, take us back to how this all began. Because you guys were fed up with 
the sounds you had available, I guess, and, and you wanted to make something and it became sort well, of a e- secret society. That, yeah. As composers, you yeah. guys are, are starting to think about, you know, the, the flexibility that you need and certain sounds that you're probably building for a lot of your projects. And so I'm sure that that also kind of gives you a little momentum to say, Hey, maybe there's some kind of a standard that we could build out of this, but can you, yeah. As Kenny said, walk us through the stages of, Hey, what do you think about this idea of actually trying to make kind of an entrepreneurial thing out of this? Well, that, that came very late in the day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. It's, it's funny. It's, um, it's, it, I don't know. I, I think if I was to offer up a secret to the success of being a successful entrepreneur is, is don't work out, don't worry about making money out of what you're doing first. Um, uh, my side of the story was I went to see the Motorcycle Diaries, uh, which was composed by Gustavo Santa Ulaya, and I fell in love with this guitar instrument. And um, so I went to my local folk guitar shop called Hobgoblin Music, still there in uh, North Soho in london and i played them an excerpt from the uh, motorcycle diaries and they said it's a it's a chirango um and so i bought one off them and then because i'm a keyboard player i I, I can't play this thing so i got my brother who's a bass player to play the chirango and i said to him just make sure you play every note wrong to the point he kept on going don't use that one i was going no no it's great it's great it's great i quickly edited it put it together on an exs in logic and it's the only time in my life i've said this is life-changing and it was um, it just actually, if you don't record them like everyone else is recording samples perfectly, um, you know, uh, to make every note sound the same, if you make every note sound different and you put performance into it, it just comes to life. And Paul, you know, your side of the story, you've done something similar and then you saw me getting banned from something. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was quite funny. I'd, we, we had sort of, we'd not really crossed paths, but we shared an agent um in Airedale in London and so um and I had been recording I'd always just recorded stuff my own samples for for the jobs that I was doing anyway um and I'd started experimenting on recording a solo violin with a friend of mine who's a violinist and she would come in and I'd get to do kind of these strange you know jumping around playing notes in different orders and things like that and then try and edit it together and go there's something in this this is this is working really, really well. Um, so then, then uh, Christian and I kind of uh, got together um, after this um, kind of funny episode over a over a beer and a kind of um, limp sandwich. You found me on MySpace. <laughs> it was MySpace. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you couldn't right, you couldn't right. find me on the forum that I was kicked off because they right. thought I was a troll. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going right. on like, why, why are people recording samples like this? Terrible. And uh, well, yeah, they didn't like that very much. So they kicked me off. And uh, yeah, so we went, we went for a pint. <laughs> we went for a pint. We went for a pint. And then we, and we basically said, well, let's, um, let's, let's t- take a few hours at air. And because we both recorded there and, and loved the room. And uh, let's see what we can come up with. And, and we, the, we were both interested at that point in chamber strings. Um, it happened that Christian was working on a job. I was working on a job that both needed a slightly smaller string section. And it's really hard when you're uh, demonstrating stuff to a director, as you guys would know, um, if you play something that sounds enormous and say it's going to be really great if we only have, you know, 20 players, they're going to kind of go, hmm, (laughs) that sounds a little bit frightening to me. So um, so it was it was important for us both to have some really, really great chamber strings to be able to demonstrate these smaller indie style scores. Um, So we started by booking three hours of, of downtime and we got some players in, I think probably six players uh, led by Cleo Gould. So we were absolutely spoiled from the offset. And, um, and we called it violin two because we figured that if we made a total hash of it, then we could always come back and record something better. <laughs> and that would be our violin one. <laughs> Love it. So um, <laughs> yeah. So, so we grabbed a, a load of stuff in that three hours and tested out the way that we were going to record these things. And I started editing it together. Christian, in the meantime, was talking to Harry Gregson Williams, I think was the first person yeah. to actually use the sound. Well, the thing I said into the pub is, Paul, I absolutely do not want to set up a company. Let's just, <laughs> let's just sell, it, sell it to our successful friends. And I'd been doing a lot of work with Harry. And I thought, if we get Harry on board, 
um, uh, um, that would be great because I think then other composers would come on board. And that's what we did. Yeah, that was the idea. So it was really a kind of private club. So people could buy a license and then um, and th- they would be able to use the sounds. Um, and that would... And, and that the, would uh, sorry. Sorry, Paul. Sorry. No, that's okay. And that would bankroll it. That would bankroll it. Yeah, absolutely. It. And the second rule of being a, a, a good entrepreneur, which, again, <laughs> we weren't aware of, is create scarcity. So there was this rumor about this library that was recorded at Hall that you couldn't buy commercially. And it just meant there are kind of lots of people with their nose up. Yeah, you can't have it, in. so you want it. It's like the line outside of the club. If there's no line out, then why would you want to go there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. so we put, yeah, we put the, the clip, clipboard fascist on the front door and <laughs> um, created that, that, that interest. And um, yeah, I think that what, what, what's at the heart of why, why it's worked um, is because Paul and I are composers. So we just really kind of intuit what composers need um and 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 that continues to this day and, and often when paul and i are working on projects it throws up conundra i don't know if that's the correct word, <laughs> but it throws up these conundrums that um you know the solutions of which become commercial opportunities almost. um but also you know so often we'll do something that we don't want to share <laughs> but we always do but we don't want to share because it's so good um but I think that's because we're just we're the end we're the end user as well as the the people who develop these things. Yeah, and the that's... really interesting thing I think my introduction to you, Christian. I forget when you did that whole scoring session that you recorded. It's on YouTube. It's really fascinating yeah. um, it, because no one has done that. You know, it's all it's all little you know EPKs or whatever, just little snippets. You get two minutes of of uh, of how that works. And um, that was really fascinating to see kind of in action and especially in such a scenic environment. But, um, yeah. but I remember this is probably, I mean, this is already a, a ways in. I'm not from the music space, but our, the documentary we made score came about partially because I think Hans Zimmer did a percussion package several yeah. years ago, maybe in 2011. No, it would have been 2014, maybe something along those lines. And, um, there was just enough of of it must have been the you know the the promo for that or something like that, but um, it was really just strikingly well put together to the point where I was thinking, and again, I'm am not musical in the slightest, really. I'm just I just appreciate the the mood of it, the feeling of it. But um, I was like, oh man, this is kick ass! I got to buy this. <laughs> so whatever you guys were doing was working really well. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, it's that, really interesting. Right. One of the things that we, um, one of the things that we're really passionate about is music education. And where I remember when I was at, uh, I, I kind of found my way into music through a slightly odd route by doing aeronautical engineering first. But that, but I'd managed to get on a course to do an MA in music for one year, and that must have been in '93. And back then, to find out this kind of stuff, what, like what equipment are people using, what do, what goes on in studios, I was basically trying to get hold of magazines like Audio Media and things like that and kind of ripping stories out. There'd be a couple of pages of, you know, what what's hands up to, what's in his studio. A few pictures of the studio, and you'd sort of look at it and go, I wonder what that is. What's that? Yeah, I still and do that. <laughs> that was the only way. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the only way that you could get this information. And so – now, uh, you know, we've got this, the Spitfire channel has got tons and tons of educational stuff on. Christian's got his own um, YouTube channel. I've got a little YouTube channel as well. And we just we just try and put as much stuff up as possible so that people can kind of see, look over your shoulder. It's the kind of virtual, um, you know, it, when working as a T-boy or whatever. It's that It's that kind of thing. How do you get in? How do you kind of see what people are doing? How do you do that? It's all that kind of stuff. And I think it's just, um, I think it's really, really valuable. And I wish that it had been available when I was starting out. I really would have loved that. The key here as well is because, you know, Paul and I come from interesting uh, uh, backgrounds. And I didn't, I didn't study m- music at college and, and I struggled to read music. And I think that, and, and whilst I congratulate people who do go to music college, I think that's something that Paul and I are really into as fathers of lots of daughters between us is inclusivity. And the gender mix in our area of the business is still terrible, as is the uh, diversity. So we think by just kind of cranking the doors open 
and by openly admitting that I possibly can't read the viola clair. Um, and I think, Paul, you've probably struggled there as well. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a terrible thing to say. I, t- I totally do. <laughs> um, that, um, that anyone can ha- could and, and should have a go. What was very interesting about the, the Tutankhamun uh, scoring session that you mentioned was that I, um, I did that to show people how quickly you can work with musicians who aren't rehearsed. You get things in one or two takes in London. It was really to promote that. And inadvertently, um, uh, uh, Jake Jackson wasn't available that day. So it was recommended that I work with Fiona Cruikshank, who I've worked with on, on many productions, but as an assistant. And she was just maturing into a full-blown senior engineer at Air Studios. And I just think it's great on the internet, for the sake of our daughters, that um, the, the only one of those full-scale sessions that's on the internet does have a not only a, a girl engineering, but doing a excuse my French, a bloody great job doing it. Yeah. yeah. Really good job. And she's now one of the top engineers in the UK. Um, and that, that very much goes to the heart of what, um, what we're about as dads, I guess, Paul. Yeah. Well, you've really yeah, uh, democratized this to the level where, you know, a lot of the things that you are making available are, some of them are free, <laughs> which is great. You know, you can get the, the basic tools for this stuff and, people can start to create really, really interesting. I mean, we hear the demos in every episode we do of Score the Podcast. You know, these are really, really incredible pieces to think that they were created with samples, you know, which is still kind of a concept that is, uh, you know, is is frowned upon. But, um, man, some of the things that you can do now, and you guys are right yeah. at the cutting edge. I, before we jumped into that, I wanted to go back. You mentioned Harry Gregson-Williams being the first composer or among the first composers to really give this a spin. What was that process like getting this to him for him to kind of check it out for him to, you know, take some time to familiarize yourself with some of these tools. So kind of what was that like from your perspective? Well, I, it was, we were using um, a thing called GVI. It was the Giga Studio virtual instrument. Um, And it only existed for a period of about six months um, and then Giga Studio was no more. So unfortunately, we then had to completely switch over and, and start using Contact. But we had this first build, which was in GVI, which was just the violin twos. And we had sent them over. I think, I think Harry was working at the hospital, uh, the members club, the hospital, not the, um, <laughs> not the actual hospital. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. His little da- unknown day job of Harry Grayson Williams. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was so he had a room there which which with all his gear in in London cuz I think I guess that's where they were post posting and and so uh we got him this thing and then a couple of days later I think um I think Christian you you kind of rang him up to see what he thought and he was just like this is brilliant where's the rest of it so <laughs> so we thought okay okay so so that's when we went back in and recorded the rest of the chamber strings and that was our first our first thing was the was this bespoke Chambers. And you knew you were onto something there because... No, no, we wanted to finish. Okay. <laughs> we wanted to finish. Paul's a composer. He shouldn't be editing samples. <laughs> and um, and but, but these very, very successful composers kept going, okay, where's the rest? Where's the woodwinds? Yeah, okay, now brass. And then we thought, okay, now we're finished. They went, no, symphonic strings next. <laughs> and it wasn't... And then I was thought, okay, well, we might as well finish it off and do the percussion. And um, they all went, no, we don't want those. So what was the point <laughs> in all of this where you realized, okay, this is going to end up being an entire, you know, maybe, you know, let's do the whole orchestra. Let's do variations of all of that. Let's start to build out the possibilities of what this can be. Honestly, it really, really wasn't a commercial enterprise. It was just we felt because we were charging a lot of money for these songs. And I, 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 we've never really said this, Paul, but I just felt that we felt beholden to them to kind of honour this thing that we'd started. And it was exciting, naturally, but it was hell for Paul because he was doing everything. <laughs> I was just like des- designing the odd silly little thing that we used to stick on the CDs we used to send out. But um, yeah, and so I think that we thought, okay, we'll just finish up with the percussion and that'll be it. But Paul will be able to explain this, that none of this consortium wanted the percussion. And we'd been in, it was during the, the DGA strike, or was it the writer's mm. strike? Uh, Basically all the, of the studios. 2008? Yeah, the writer's strike, I think. Yeah. yeah. Seven yes. or eight, um, yeah. Yeah, and um, so we had loads of availability at the studio air. So we went in for a month 
So it was a lot of outlay for us. And, and the, the, the composers didn't want it. So we had to go commercial. Yeah, it was, it's a funny thing because obviously now that we've done Hans Zimmer percussion, you, you know, you, you kind of have a clear idea of what Hans' stuff was at that time. Obviously, he, changed, he kind of reinvents himself every so often. Um, but the uh, you know John Powell had um, been had recorded tons and tons of his own percussion at various venues in LA, and I think that tended to be a thing. Like there were quite a lot of these A-list composers were were very fussy about their percussion and kind of saw the percussion in some ways as a kind of signature. Um, so so we were left with kind of going, oh my god, what are we going to do? So we went back to Joby, the percussionist, Joby Burgess, and said, look, we are kind of thinking about, you know, selling this as a commercial product to, to make the, the costs back. How do you feel about that? You know, if we give you a royalty on the sales or do you think or do you, are you not happy with that? And he was completely up for it. He was he said, yeah, that's great. Fine. So we did that and um, we, we got to. Uh, we got 5,000 sets of DVDs pressed. Oh, no, 5,000 individual DVDs So, because there were multiple DVDs. Well, let me – can I back you up a little bit? Package. What was the process of – this is a new thing where now you're going to try to actually sell this to a bigger group of people. This is going to be made available to a lot more people. Did you have a yeah. email mailing list or something that you were, were operating with, or how did you acquire all of these people that would be interested in this? It was literally just kind of – it was a bit of word of mouth. Okay. Um, we VI went control? On VI control, on yeah, on there and on a couple of other forums. Um, we took out an ad in Sound on Sound. We thought, you know, let's, get, let's go for it. And, uh, and so we had, we had some really quite bizarre production problems at the beginning. So we'd, we'd kind of got everything ready, got the installers, everything was sorted. DVDs mastered, and then um, we decided to make a, an Apple box, you know, that kind of, because everyone loves an Apple box. So, so we deconstructed an Apple box and sent it off to, to this um, company that made boxes and printed on them. And they said, yes, yes, we can do that. It's easy. So they sent us the first one back, and it didn't quite fit together properly, and the printing was all offset because they'd made a mistake when they laid it out. So... At this point, Christian's flat was starting to look like a warehouse because there were like piles and piles of these gigantic boxes of boxes. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll re rerun it. Um, we know what we did wrong. And so um, they then went bust. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to trash all the boxes. And in the meantime, also, um, we had started to get uh, – we'd started to sell a physical copy um, – and the this uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was a volcano in Iceland, wasn't it? Yeah, a volcano, volcano erupted in Iceland, and that completely destroyed uh, shipping for about oh a month. God. So everything was in chaos, and so we had to work out a way of delivering it via the internet. And so that's that took us into that kind of next stage. It was just the internet was just about fast enough at that point to be able to send this kind of amount of data. To this is straight out of Shark um, Tank. This is one of these horror <laughs> stories. I think everyone assumes that all businesses just like they had an idea and it's like on store shelves and everyone loves it. But like hearing no. these real stories, uh, it's just all the all the stresses and, and the little things that you don't think about. But yeah. And when that, your apartment starts again, to fill up with, you know, boxes <laughs> that you now can't even use, <laughs> you know, you're in this weird business world. And of course, the volcano issue. That's always a shipping problem. Of course. <laughs> of course. But again, it was just so that we could get the cost back for the, 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 the thing. So we went into business to totally by mistake. Um, and it wasn't, I think, Paula, I don't know if you agree, you know, we, we didn't quite get all the cost back for percussions. So we came up with this idea for Albion, which is called Blitzkrieg originally, until someone said it's a really bad word, <laughs> don't call it that. And um, so uh, uh, we called it Albion. Spitfire was a mistake because it, it was a company that I had on the sh shelf and my accountant was getting annoyed that all of the things were going through my personal business account. So Spitfire was just something that we had on the shelf. Um, and then uh, it was, I think we decided to do Albion 2, which was kind of going back to what we originally started out to do, which is Chambers. And we just wanted to try and bring Chambers to the masses. Um, 
and I think uh, certainly for myself, Paul, that that was the turning point where we kind of pre-announced it, and we we put it on live. We only had one login for our site, so Paul and I kept on logging each other off to see the numbers, and it was we got this sensation that there was this queue around the corner, like you get when Apple releases something new. And this is when I went, oh, this is this is extraordinary. And it wasn't just a queue of people, you know, one after the other buying this a chamber library, um, but it was um, childhood heroes, heroes, people like Willie Snuffy Walden, you know, who owned TV in America for, you know, when I totally. was uh, growing up. And I think that that was, I think, the turning point um, for us, by which point you'd emigrated, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'd moved to um, I'd moved to L.A. Um, to try and get but... away from it. <laughs> <laughs> so which actually was quite helpful because it meant that we were running a 24-hour operation by that point i was actually <laughs> it was just i was gonna ask you about like was there because i imagine at a certain point you're getting messages from people that are discovering this through a friend of a friend of a friend or was there a certain composer or somebody that reached out and said hey i just got your package and this thing's amazing or you know was that like was there an eye-opening name that you saw that including Snuffy Walden, but anyone else that came across your work that you never would have expected would be using this stuff? Uh, it never ends. And I, I, when, when, it, when, I, when it happens, when Paul and I together, I'll just look over to Paul and go, just another one of those incredible Spitfire moments. Both Paul and I have had uh, relative amounts of success as, as media composers. And you, you think the thing that you wanted to do since you were a kid is is going to be your your Billy Bunter, you know those kind of sporting stories that you read, um, but it's just it's just been incredible, and I think that we've all we both had our, I mean I think for for, for me it was when Hans Zimmer rang up and said, and are I going to get a copy of this? You know, <laughs> oh, but we're we're kind of copying you, Hans. So now th <laughs> then you have the question of do you say there's a list? Let me check. Like do you kind of because then you really elevate it, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, the, the, the biggest highs have been um, the people that we have collaborated with. And that's what's really transformed our business is this idea that we're not building just virtual instruments. We're capturing the essence of people. Um, and I think that's what makes, makes it really interesting. And it started with Hans and he rang up and he says, um, he said, um, I want to do a, a percussion library with you. And he said, um, um, do you need to ask Paul? And I went, no, <laughs> okay, announce it now. So I quickly ran up Paul and I said, Paul, I'm going to be announcing something on the website. It's going to cost us a lot of money, but I think you'll like it. <laughs> um, I think that there are, there are certain composers. There are composers. It's very interesting. There's an interesting, um, a horribly sexist moment in the middle of it, but there's an interesting interview between Pharrell and, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Brian Eno's guy co-produced um, the um, YouTube. Daniel stuff. Lanois. Daniel Lanois. And it, was, it really shows the two, two sides of composers. Pharrell admitted to being a curator of sound. So he gathered sounds from different sources, puts them together brilliantly. Whereas Daniel Lanois makes sounds. And I think that I estimate it's about 10% of the composing fraternity are, are makers. And you kind of, we, you spot them. So you... I have no no doubt that Olafur Arnolds and Hans Zimmer would get on like a house on fire and, and would be speaking until the early hours of the morning, talking about making sounds. And that's what's been great is to meet these people who are interested in making sounds. And, you know, you thought you couldn't beat Hans Zimmer ringing up to say, can we make a library with you? Well, I have to say, no offence, Hans, uh, when Bernard Herrmann's estate got in touch. Yeah, so cool. Um, and said, should we make a thing? That was That was a pinch yourself moment. So that's very that, interesting because then the structure of that is, I mean, Bernard Herrmann's not around <laughs> anymore. So it's like you're taking elements and starting to figure out how to maybe reverse engineer some of those. Yeah. So we had um, a whole load of uh, password protected handwritten scores. Um, wow. You know, uh, really high quality scans. And for me, as a, you know, as a kid who grew up, um, you know, watching um you know jason and the argonauts on the telly or uh i don't know just just watching those kind of movies um and hearing herman's scores um it's just really really odd to go back to it now and listen to the scores and look at the look at the hand handwriting and see the process and the crossing out in places and 
and just absolutely fascinating. And, but the but the thing is, you can spot these things because because of the kind of cellular nature of his compositional style and the way that he laid his scores out. It's really really clear when he's when he's doubling stuff. You go, oh yeah, I can I can see exactly what's happening there. Because he's written that and then written it again down here. Um, and so picking out those things and those kind of colours became quite straightforward. Um, and then it was just really just from that embarrassment of riches. How do you, you know, how do you make a hit list of the things that you're going to record? Because there's so much that you could. Totally. A little point of trivia is he didn't call the shower scene the shower scene. He called it the murder. And it's just so funny how obviously that name got attached later on. But it's, an, it's insane to look at the incorrectly named murder cue and to go, this is probably the most famous cue in movie history. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people who've never seen the film, my kids haven't seen Psycho. They're really young. They go, eh, eh, eh. They know right. it. You don't have An to see it to privilege. know it. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And it's because of the music. Um, so now that, I mean, fast forward, there's, what, 90, 100 libraries now. I'm wondering, like, what your meetings are like. How do you come up with a library and and then where, what do you do? I mean, yeah, what's the you've, process? You've recorded kind of... so many thousands of sounds. How do you come up with a new idea for a library when you've already recorded every instrument on the planet? Yeah, but I think that's what's really interesting. You know, if you listen to the way orchestras played, you know, in the 1980s and the 1970s and the 1950s, it, 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 it moves on. Um, and as do 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 styles you know we when we started out hybrid was all the thing scandy became a thing you know we started working some some folk musicians this year and the possibilities are just endless you only have to listen to a piece of music you know orchestrated by marla to realize that the combinations and the possibilities and the the different formants that you can create is is endless and that's what makes it so romantic and i'd love to say that there's a process but usually it's a text message port isn't it I've had an idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Paul goes, we'll just... what about this? Or actually yeah. with Paul, it's, I hope you don't mind. I'm in the studio recording this. <laughs> <laughs> or send a um, clip of something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, I think that we observe and get a sense. We tr like to try and be ahead of the curve. So we did this Tundra thing, which um, was the first time we really had to kind of aggressively really think about not aggressively really think about the marketing because on paper it sounds like such a bad idea a quiet orchestral library um which is what it is um but i got this sense that this icelandic scandinavian thing was really kind of bubbling under the surface um and um we thought that, that would really suit that kind of emerging zeitgeist um i can see that folk horror is really having an amazing resurgence and got a sense that after lockdown, I think people will be making more personal stories and stuff. We felt that would be a good offering for that. But so often, Paul, it'll be, with you, it'll be maybe a te technological innovation that will sp spur an entire, you know, for example, the um, uh, percussion, um, uh, percussion swarm library and, and those kind of yeah. clusters. And, um, um, and then um, often with me, it'll be a visual problem that i'll come up with a wacky solution for so um mine for this we make these things called swarms and it was um uh, it was some some grass blowing and the director said make it make it feel hot i went okay 24 mandolins and the horn all of these <laughs> so. i can actually i've got something let me let me just grab something and i can show you something kind of curious. very cool yeah but this is I keep this up by my synth rack to remind me to remind me to constantly constantly think in abstract ways about things, and this this is uh, an idea for a sample library. So it's a, it's I've put at the top things like Euclid, rounded, smooth but articulated, not too not too pointed or harsh, and this is what became Kepler. So it can often be. It can often be just thinking about a problem and kind of trying to trying to work out. I can hear a sound in my head, but I, there's no way to actually articulate that with sample libraries at the moment. And if you're going to try and write an entire score um, with a something like you know something unusual, some unusual concept, you have to 
you have to have a toolkit to do it with to demonstrate it because these days nobody will just let you you know nobody will let you go oh i think i can i think i understand what you mean and i'm sure it'll be fine so just just go for it um but you know i think probably quite a lot of people have heard this now because it was used um in the queen's gambit mm, so um with carlos so those kind of interesting strange you know uh brass sounds and things like that and this kind of complex moving you know it's a blend obviously it's a blend of of live and sample but um yeah i think that's that's often a path is trying to solve do you have an ear is- to hear when if you're watching a show or something will you hear something and say that's us we yeah. did that they're like your babies they're like your babies <laughs> yeah Someone sent me an ISIS recruitment video once. Oh, and I no. was like, that's, that's, that. It was, it was, Albion was all over it. It was like, that's not what we made oh, it for. Oh, no. God. <laughs> you didn't, no, you really, didn't retweet like, that disturbing. one, I'm guessing. But no, no, no. I, I mean, that was really actually genuinely quite disappointing. But um, uh, often I'll be moved to tears. You know, be, it'll be on a beautiful piece of work, beautiful composition, and you'll hear something that maybe you even play, you know, um, and, and it's great. I think there's two really important objectives here for us. Is often people complain, oh, you're putting out too many libraries. And it's like my somewhat flippant answer is, so you want less choice. Something I hate about what sampling did when we were getting into this was this homogenization. And it's not just sonic homogenization. I think samples are not just ways of obeying the ideas that you come up with orchestrally or compositionally. They're actually compositional aids. And you tend to lean into what the sample is good at and it affects the way that you write. And if we're all using the same tools, then we're all going to write the same stuff. Um, so for me, it's like it's actually a really important part of our kind of ethos is to introduce choice, innovation and inspire people to write music that sounds different. And I think that, Paul, your production of the uh, Bernard Herman Library, if someone's looking for something really new that's going to make them sound really fresh, and write stuff they wouldn't probably have thought of writing before. Um, you know, that is a great library to go for as an, as an example. It's funny you mentioned using the same types of sounds and stuff because in the mid-2000s, I worked for Apple. And I, re- I specifically remember this because I was in the store all the time and you play around with GarageBand. And if you remember, uh, Fort Minor, it was one of the guys from Linkin Park, did his own album and one of his songs, the main looping melody rhythm of the song is like cello one from Garage Band. <laughs> and I remember hearing it and being like, are you kidding me? And I, I went back and played it. And it was, I mean, this was early on in Garage Band days and people were just getting into this like digital audio workstation lifestyle. And I just remember thinking, man, they got to get some more sounds. <laughs> like how is, yeah. it wasn't even an instrument either. It was the full on untouched loop. And I just remember that like blew me away. I always think about that when I see uh, workstations like that. Paul, but, I'm, I'm sure we agree with this. You agree with me on this, Paul, but I actually, I, that's always really upset me. I remember that, that massive dance hit. You know, the one with the terrible acoustic guitar. <laughs> And you're just like, I'm sorry, that's just not good enough. <laughs> and so I Probably think a, that's another yeah. another ambition for Paul and I is to actually Im- Im- improve how professional and how excellent we sound as a as a profession. Um, Do you know I what mean, those, Paul, you, you have the the uh, you have the story of Hans Zimmer talking about the um, what's it called the multiplex effect. Oh yeah. Oh well, he said, you know, I never want to hear the same the same drums as my drums coming from the next multiplex along you know it's that it's that kind of thing of but also he basically got to the end of the dark knight trilogy and said i need to uh i'm going to share this because it will force me to come up with something new because i i don't want to i don't want to just keep using the same stuff again and again i don't want to keep repeating myself but something that we've tried to build into from the very beginning um we would right right back to the chamber, the bespoke chamber string. So the very first thing we recorded, um, we designed some effects patches, uh, and because we knew, like, the well, the thing that I was working on um, 
I definitely needed some decent string effects for. And so we did these things, but every I wanted everything to be controllable. So different pitches that you could go use the mod wheel to go through dynamics and all this kind of stuff. So that you could musically play the effect that you were using to the screen, to the picture. And when you then extend that into, you know, the microphones that we that we record and the fact and the options that you have to kind of craft your own sound. It's really, really important to me, you know, having grown up with where you can always hear that, I won't name it, but the, the one um, famous, uh, well-used library that, that lots and lots of people have um, that has a couple of risers in it. And you just hear, because there's like three or four in the library, you, and it came out in the early 2000s, I guess, you hear them in everything. And you just, you just go, yeah, that's that from that library. And I always hated that. And I always wanted to feel like people could create their own sound with our stuff. They, they could make something unique to them uh, and and not have their creativity restricted. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. In some kind of arbitrary way. I wanted to ask you about the Labs series um, because this is a, a really cool thing. And, you know, not, it's a lot of students are getting into music and they want to try and produce something, but maybe they don't have – the budget or mom and dad can't afford the, you know, package, the, the cool new Spitfire package, but you're, you're creating these labs. What inspired that? And, and what kind of feedback are you getting from uh, young and upcoming composers that are, are able to utilize these tools uh, as well as professionals being able to use them too. But I, I feel like there's something really cool about the ability to get your hands on these tools that normally wouldn't maybe have the money to, to get. Um, it's, I think I'm probably applying a little bit of hindsight here, but it, it, it stemmed from the fact that Paul and I used to do cheeky little experiments. Or I'd make some samples for this film I was working on, or Paul would make some samples for, um, uh, uh, you know, Little Big Palette or whatever. And, and, and I used to share them with Paul. I used to share them with my brother Joe, who's a composer as well. And, and I just think we thought it'd be just be nice to just to expand on that little group of people. Um, so what it is now, it's just a massive community. And that's, I think that's what we are. I think that um, the, the generation previous to us, I don't know if you experienced it, Paul, it tended to be quite competitive. And I think now it's become more of a community. And, and I'm just really delighted that people are getting joy out of it. But what I'm most delighted about is that people really get it. And they're really odd, a lot of the things. But they all sound great and they're all inspiring. And what I really like about people using it is they're using great great you know it sounded modest but they're using great sounds as opposed to cello number one in garage bands no effect offense to our friends <laughs> how about just, you, Paul? I, <laughs> I have to i have to just i'm, I'm going to get back onto labs but i have to just say you know about rihanna you know about umbrella yeah. so if you listen to umbrella and you flick through the funk i think loops in logic pro you'll find no the entire that one too from umbrella <laughs> yeah the whole thing Anyway, um, that that aside, um, but that was I that was the new great... that was a new big sound at the time. I'm sure they were like, "Oh, yeah. look at this system." And Logic wasn't that was the, I think it, at that time that was one of the first big software. I mean, there wasn't a lot out there at that time. Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a huge huge collection of sounds. Um, but I, I yeah the the labs. It, Christian's absolutely right. I mean, people were people were extraordinarily guarded about their stuff. And so, you know, we really enjoyed sharing sounds with each other and we, we found something that was good and, and worked. And it was... Sounds great. we they made, were, I have hasten to add, Paul. Sounds yes, we made. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sounds, we, sounds we made. So, like, you know, hand bells. We recorded um, all the wine glasses and all. I think there were probably three or four versions of that over the years and a lot of broken wine glasses. But um, all of these things, we use them in different ways. So, you know, the, with, the, with the glasses, what became uh, Glass and Steel in its latest incarnation of a, you know, Spitfire library um, was kind of born of this, you know, let's record every wine glass, every bit of china, some steel bowls, all kinds of things with different beaters. And, um, and we used them in really, really different ways. And that, I found that very interesting because... It just completely, um, you know, it completely, people can take the same group of sounds and they will come up with something totally different. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I love about it. And with labs, 
it did start with just uh, you know stuff that Christian and I had made in our uh, in you know for previous projects, and we thought um, what we actually originally started doing was we we were selling them to raise money for charity. Um, we decided that had become kind of there were it, we wanted to put it into its own piece of software so that there was no barrier to entry, so that people could just. Um, load up a, a, a plugin and just start using it. Mm -hmm. Genuinely free, um, and so that was a transition moment. And what we transitioned to on the on the charity side was we decided that from that moment when we stopped selling these samples, we would give one percent of our turnover to charity to the same partners that we were already working with. Um, and so that and so Labs is kind of the the birthplace of that idea. And so I like to, it feels good to me that there are so many people benefiting from labs, but also probably unknowingly, they are also helping, you know, um, benefit these charities because the birthplace of labs was us making something where we could donate to charity. Um, it gets, so um, it's, it's been really good. Yeah, I think that something that's really important is, you know, even uh, labs were originally $3. Um, and there's many parts of the world where that might be a day's pay. And in fact, I found it very touching when uh, a, a, a group of composers from Bangladesh got in touch with us to say there's just no way that they can, can find an entry point into buying any samples of any sort. So they really appreciate being able to compete on the world, world stage. I imagine a lot of them are using things like Reaper um, or, or those. I think Reaper's uh, uh, free, isn't it? Um, yes, I think it is. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, these, you know, the free doors that you can get. And they're going to, to labs. And it just brings me back to a point, Matt, that I wanted to mention. I, I think this word, uh, if I may be so about this, but the word democratization is, is, is an okay one. I think what it does is it just it stops our world being just an enclave for people of privilege. But what I think it does do is, and something I really promote, is the people who rise to the top are still incredibly conscientious, so do what they do well. And work really, really hard at it. And those people will still all rise to the top. I think it's a mistake to feel that anyone has the same chance as anyone else. I think there's an, a, a quality of opportunity here um, that we are presenting. Um, but it it's not, doesn't necessarily guarantee an equality of outcome. And I think that that is, is really important, that it's, it's, it, it is actually down to you as a composer. Um, to make the best music in the best way and be a lovely person to work with um, and, and, and to work very, very hard at it. I love we've that. definitely not made it any easier. Yeah. That's, that's, we've definitely not made it any easier. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, with the amount of stuff that's available now, you guys have really revolutionized this. And you talked about what the percentage of 10% are creators. I, I'm sure that number has gone up since you guys came into play because – you, there's no way you haven't inspired people to start recording sounds and and do what you did because I mean you proved it right. You're composers who had this idea and you started doing it and you you made it clear that anyone that's a composer that wants to hear a sound or, or create a sound can do that. And I I, th I just and think Kenny, it's remarkable. Well, thank you. And Kenny, I think it's really it's uh, I, I think it's it's a great time to be involved in this industry because I genuinely feel that we're going to hit a golden age and people are going to work out how to make a decent living out. Of, I know a composer who makes a decent living out of creating um, uh, uh, the, the, the entire sound for podcasts. He purposely uh, uh, records beautiful music. He, he edits the dialogue. He dubs the whole thing together and he's his own one man cottage industry and he's very successful. More people are making content than ever before by an order of magnitude. Um, studios are being built in the UK to accommodate the Netflixes and the Amazons of this world. So it's a golden era. We've just got to get out there. And, you know, we may not be, you know, uh, living in big mansions like our, uh, our forefathers and mothers uh, did, you know, who are the Bernard Hermans of this world and all of that kind of stuff. But I think there's a way of earning money out of music. Um, and I think that's going to increase. So I'm glad for us to be kind of servicing that need. Absolutely. Well, this has been really fun, guys. Um, I, I, like I said, when, when traveling picks back up, it, next time we're in London, I will definitely 
hope to link up at some point and get a coffee or a beer or something if you guys are uh, free. But Definitely. I know that you've got a lot going on with both composing and constantly recording and creating and all of this stuff. But um, we, we and the variety again, you coming, guys are making available is just yeah. fantastic. I mean, it's we really, get so it's many notes from people, for people that like music that want to get into it. I'm sure you guys uh, get tagged like we do, but we get tagged all the time on social from people all over the world saying, look at this cue I made from Spitfire. Check this one out. And it's so yeah. cool to see the reach that you guys have um, across the world with people in places I've never even heard of sometimes, um, which is just, yeah. it's just, it's inspiring. And I'm not a, I'm not a musician. Um, I'm fascinated by the subject. I love film. And like Matt said, the mood, what, how it makes you feel is it's addicting. Like you want, more of it and you want to hear it and you want to be surrounded by it but just to see that type of inspiration that you guys have created can't be and beyond commended that, enough the talent that is out there that is gaining access in many ways the same way that garage band did a decade ago with you know really basic sounds but all of these perspectives can be reflected through what you guys are creating so I don't think it's an understatement to say that the future of music is going to evolve as a result of what you guys have built. And, and sure, other companies too, but the amount that you've been able to achieve is just really impressive and doing a, a huge service, I think, for the future of music. And that's got to feel pretty cool. Oh, thanks, Matt. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, you have to look at companies like Ableton who are, you know, changing the way that people create music and stuff on it. It is. It's a community, and it's a it's 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 a great honor to be part of it, both as a composer and a developer. Well, boys, thank you so much for coming on, and um, we look forward to to more packages. Every time we Absolutely. check our email, there's something new coming out. It's exciting. I, I had a pre-production <laughs> chat about a library that is the most bonkers thing we've ever done. So keep an eye out around November. It's <laughs> is that the name of and it, it? You're it no no but it it I'm, i might actually say that should be the strap it's bonkers um uh, uh kenny it will be beer if you're coming to visit us in london maybe we can have a coffee with you in america when we terrific <laughs> yeah i'll do it all we'll do a espresso and a beer at the same time i mean depends on <laughs> the time of day but no, we look forward to it, you guys. Thank you so much. And and Robert says hello, and he was bummed that he couldn't make the time work out for this one. But he said that he so you guys Robert, linked up at one point. I've met Robert once, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a big fan as well. And um, thanks again for all you guys do for uh, the show too. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it.